Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. This is Dr. Mohit Bhandari, Bariatric Metabolic Robotic Surgeon from Mohok Bariatrics and Robotic Surgery Center here in India, along with Professor Phoebe, inviting all of you and welcoming you at the 19th episode of the Virtual Bariatric University. Virtual Bariatric University is an initiative started by us to train and disseminate knowledge to young surgeons interested in the field of bariatric and metabolic surgeries. Today, our topic is laparoscopic adjusted gastric banding. The adjustable gastric band is now performed in minuscule numbers across the world. But we believe that it still finds a place in the algorithm of treating a morbidly obese patient. Let me tell you that even the least effective bariatric surgical procedure is much more effective than the medicine which is having highest efficacy for treating obesity. Therefore, although the numbers of laparoscopic adjustable bands have gone down drastically, and we will discuss the reasons, the pros and the cons throughout this episode, but I think it is very appropriate to discuss about this issue at the Virtual Bariatric University. Let me introduce you to the stellar group of faculty which we have for this show. We have Professor Natan Zundal from US. Natan is a clinical professor of surgery at the Department of Surgery at Buffalo, New York. Additionally, he also functions as a consultant for minimally invasive and bariatric surgery of program at San Fide Bogata and as a bariatric surgeon at Jackson's North Medical Center in Miami. Dr. Zundal has extensive experience with minimally invasive and bariatric procedures. He's an active member of various, at the executive boards of various committees in ACS, ASMBS, SAGES, IPSO, and many others. And he also served as the founder, active member, and honorary member of the surgical laparoscopic and bariatric societies in around 46 countries across the world. Nathan is a great teacher, and he has been recognized as one of the finest teachers, one of the most enthusiastic teachers in the field of bariatric and metabolic surgery. We welcome you, Professor Zundel, and we look forward to interact with you. Next, we have another friend, Sylvia Weiner from Germany. Sylvia is a leader, is one of the most celebrated bariatric surgeons in Frankfurt in Germany. And she is basically a role model for most of the young female surgeons who want to join the field of bariatric and metabolic surgery. In 2018, she specialized in visceral surgery and became the head of bariatric unit, which soon became the center of excellence in Germany as one of the most recognized German bariatric center. 2019, Sylvia became the head of the department for obesity and metabolic surgery and is currently leading one of the largest team, including more than 30 individuals with secretaries, nutritionists, physiotherapists, and a multidisciplinary team. In addition to this, Sylvia hosts the great Frankfurter meeting. She's the chairman of the meeting. And uh, I have the honor of operating in most of these meetings last three to four years. Uh, and we are so proud of the work, the recognition Sylvia has brought to this speciality. Sylvia is also leading the bariatric program at Nordwest and is recognized on the international stage because of that. Since 2002, she assisted Professor Rudy Weiner one of our teachers uh, who I think has taught generations of bariatric surgeon. And the meeting which Professor Rudy Weiner started is now very successfully run by Sylvia, carrying forward his legacy. Welcome Sylvia to the show. We are honored to have you. Next we have, I'm proud to introduce Professor Shivram from India, from Bangalore. Professor Shivram is a head of Department of Surgery and Allied Specialities and Program Director 
at bariatric and metabolic surgery at Astor CMI in Bangalore. He is in the National Executive Committee, Executive Board Member for Aussie, and is a PG teacher for National Board of Examinations. Uh, I have attended a couple of meetings hosted by Professor Shivram, and I can tell you that the volume and the quality of work he is performing in the state of Karnataka is well appreciated amongst the speciality. Welcome, Professor Shivram. It's an honor to have you. Next, we have Dr. Simon Wong from Hong Kong. Simon is the president of Asia Pacific Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery Society, and he is the chairman of the Hong Kong Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery Society. He represents Hong Kong at IFSO, and uh, Simon is a consultant surgeon in upper GI metabolic surgery at the Wales Hospital in the unit of Prince and is appointed as honorary clinical associate professor in the department of surgery in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. In 2018, he is appointed as a cluster team head of upper GI surgery of New Territories East Cluster and deputy chief of services of department of surgery, Prince of Wales Hospital. In 2002, Simon established the first MDT obesity clinic in Hong Kong, and currently he's in charge of metabolic and bariatric surgery services at Prince Wales Hospital. Simon is extending an invitation to me to lecture at his meeting he's going to organize. And because of COVID, I was supposed to visit him at Hong Kong and spend some time with him. But I think because of COVID, the meeting got canceled, and this year we're going to have it virtually. So Simon, you're doing a great job. You've brought recognition to this specialty in that part of the world. And uh, as a true leader, I'm really honored to have you at the Virtual Bariatric University. Uh, I welcome you once again. We have uh, Dr. Safwan Taha from Abu Dhabi in UAE. He's a consultant, laparoscopic, metabolic and bariatric surgeon uh, at MediClinic Airport Road Hospital. Uh, he is also one of the surgeons and centers of excellence in bariatric metabolic surgery in Abu Dhabi. He is the governor of UAE chapter of American College of Surgeons. That's a, one of the most privileged designation he has among several group of surgeons practicing in UAE. He is a member of the Board of Governors of American College of Surgeons, member of International Relations Committee of ACS, and the chair of International Scholarship Committee of the ACS. He's a very, very active member in IFSO and several other bodies like ASMBS, SAGES, and ESMBS. Welcome, Professor Taha. Uh, we look forward to interact with you more and more on this show and listen to your views and opinions about this very interesting uh, procedure, which is somehow, uh, which is somehow getting, uh, you know, uh, going down into the trend uh, because of multiple reasons. Uh, I would say it is going to become an extinct entity uh, as the time would pass and new and new innovations would come. Uh, we have Professor Manish Bejal from India. Uh, Dr. Manish is one of the, I would say, the pillars of team of Professor Chaube in New Delhi. Uh, great surgeon, uh, one of the surgeon with one of the finest skill set I have seen. And uh, Dr. Manish uh, has that, I would say, highest amount of experience because all of us know that uh, Professor Chaube started the bariatric surgery program in the country is one of the pioneers and they started with the adjustable gastric band program way back uh, when no sleeves or gastric bypasses were performed in India. So it would be you know, great to hear from them, their experience and what, what happened to adjustable gastric band in India. Again, Manish is a director at Max Institute of Minimal Access uh, Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery in Saket at Max Hospital. Uh, he was prior attached to with Professor Chaube at the Gangaram Hospital before joining the MAG group. And he is instrumental in creating 15 educational CD rooms in minimal access surgery. And uh, I would say that I was one of those who have gone through these CDs and learned a lot from them. Uh, and, and his uh, way of teaching the method methodology and the way uh, they have created those educational CD rooms uh, just reflect the attitude to disseminate education and teach every individual who would want to achieve those heights. Dr. Bajal has also been awarded the winner in the excellence in bariatric surgery category by Indian News Health Awards in November 2016. Uh, he has been conferred with the designation of Surgeon of Excellence for Bariatric Surgery uh, by the Surgical Review Corporation in USA. 
The MAMBS team at Max Healthcare Saket is a founder member of Center of Excellence for Bariatric Surgery and the Hernia Surgery. Uh, Dr. Bajal has authored innumerable number of textbooks in endohernia repair and has also more than 100 national and international publications to his own honor. Uh, welcome, Dr. Manish Bajal. And, uh, uh, you know, you would be somebody who can put this picture right in front of everybody at, as to what happened to the adjustable gastric band in India. I can say that you can put down and, you know, draw down the history for all of us to understand why and what happened and how this procedure finds a place in your practice at this point of time. Uh, once again, with my mentor, my teacher, uh, the clinical director of our center, Professor Phoebe, uh, and me, we welcome all these faculty members who are very talented, uh, one of the most sought for uh, members who are here to uh, give their time and spend energy in delivering knowledge to everybody across the board. So uh, a warm welcome from both of us. At this point of time, I would like to invite Professor Safwan Taha, Dr. Shivram, and Simon to moderate the first lecture session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Taha. Dr. Taha, you have to unmute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, well, uh, thanks a lot uh, for this very nice introduction, uh, uh, Dr. Mohit. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I mean, yourself, you, you just, I don't think you need to be uh, introduced. Uh, you're one of the most popular uh, surgeon, biotech surgeons uh, on and offline. It's an honor and pleasure to be part of this elite group of, uh, of, of, of uh, surgeons. So, uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's really, it's really a, a great initiative by, by, by BBU to, to allocate a full day for a full uh, discussion for lab band. And just like Dr. Bandari said, it's, uh, we, we all thought that it was instinct, but somehow it still has some role, give or take. Uh, and, and we're going to uh, have a very nice uh, outlay about that. I think our first speaker is, uh, is uh, Dr. Weiner. Manish. Dr. Manish. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Go ahead, Manish. Uh, share yeah. the screen with Dr. Manish, please. Yes. So I think it's a recorded lecture. You want the recorded lecture or you... Yes, please. Himanshu. Thank uh, Dr. Mohit for this virtual bariatric university that has been going on for a while. It's been a wonderful platform to continue the academics even during the era when we were unable to meet personally. And uh, thanks for this opportunity for me. I'm Dr. Manish Bajal. I'm a laparoscopic and a bariatric and GI surgeon. I work at Max Healthcare, New Delhi. With this, I would uh, be speaking on what I was asked to speak, that is laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding, our ex experience in India when we started doing bariatric surgeries. And the first ever surgery that we started to do in India was a laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding. So with this, I would like to go to my presentation I hope my slides can be seen on screen. Just expand okay. it. Yeah. So weight loss and metabolic outcomes of, after laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding. Now this was way back in 2004, 2003, 2004, when the inception of bariatric surgery took place in India. Before I start my presentation, I would like to, I have no financial disclosures. The data that I'm, group practice that we do at Max Institute of Laparoscopic Endoscopic and Bariatric Surgery at Max Healthcare, Saket, New Delhi. This is the division of procedures that we have done. This is the experience that we have at our institute. 
And if you look at the pie chart, the maximum experience that we have in our practice is a rune y gastric bypass, followed by laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, gastric bandage, revisional procedures which are ongoing. We did do a few gastric plications when the procedure was conceived again about a decade back and a very, very few mini gastric bypass or a single anastomosis gastric bypass. This is only to let you know what our experience is in the field of bariatric surgery. So I, I take you back to 2004. Now, these are the pictures that you see from the first ever bariatric surgical congress which happened in Delhi. The first one happened in 2003 was in Mumbai, followed by 2004 in New Delhi. And as you can see in the picture, our association with Dr. Phoebe goes back right at the time when we planned and when we conceived bariatric surgery in India. The first ever procedure that we actually started doing was a adjustable gastric banding for various reasons that I would talk about. And we were introduced to this surgery by our own friend, Dr. Harry from Australia, who had a huge experience at that point of time with these bands. And he was the one who performed these bands in our operation theaters. In our previous uh, institute where we used to work then, that was Sir Gangaram Hospital. So the data that I'm going to present is not a very robust data for various reasons. Number one, we did these procedures only in the first four years of our practice. Number two, we completely stopped doing these procedures since 2007. And of course, there was a change in institute. That's why we may not have a very robust data which is available to us. But nevertheless, I would like to share what we experienced with adjustable gastric banding. So a thought process as a surgeon changed over time. So when we talk about inception of surgery, when we planned our procedures, the number one thing that we looked at was the safety of surgery. Bariatric surgery or operating on obese patients was something new to us. So number one was safety, followed by, of course, you do a procedure, you want the procedure to be effective, so effectivity. Durability was the last thing on our minds when we had started these procedures. But 17 to 18 years down the line with the experience of bariatric surgery, what we see now in our practice is that durability of a particular bariatric procedure is the most important factor for broad acceptance of a procedure. So laparoscopic gastric banding, the first band that we got introduced to was called a lap band. This was marketed in India at that point of time by Inamed. And if you see the history of lap bands, they also progressed over a period of time. The first band that you see was of size 9.75. This used to have a flat balloon inside. What we got introduced to was something called a Vanguard. This is a Vanguard band, which had these grooves inside. So the idea of having these grooves was to reduce the pressure of this balloon on the gastric wall, preventing erosions. Then it progressed to two band sizes. The advantage of these band sizes, one with the capacity of 10 ml, another with a capacity of 14 ml. The advantage was these had an openable locking system. So if you were not sure after locking that you would like to redo the locking, you could do that again. Unfortunately, a couple of years down the line, when we were using these bands, the lab band disappeared from the market. So the other band that we got introduced to was marketed in India by j and &J, and it was called a Swedish quick close band. So whatever experience we have with our, uh, adjustable gastric banding is with these two kind of bands, which were available to us in the market then. This is a simple, small little glimpse of how we used to do these bands. This was a pass flaccida technique in which you made a little opening at the angle of his, right next to the right crust of diaphragm, and you passed a gold finger around the proximal part of the stomach. 
The band was introduced through the 15 mm port, threaded onto the gold finger and pulled around the stomach as you see it here. Extremely simple procedure. The gastric calibration tube came inside. The balloon was inflated to about 15 to 20 cc and pulled up at the GE junction, thus sizing the pouch. And then we had two to three gastrogastric sutures, which were onto the left side of the band with the buckle of the band onto the right of these gastrogastric sutures. The tube was pulled out and the access port was, we used to place, place this access port in the epigastrium because that was the place where it was very easy to palpate this port because when you have morbidly obese, big patients, if you have a port in an area where the abdominal wall thickness is very high, it used to be very difficult to adjust these bands in the clinic. So initially we used to place this port in the left upper abdomen and later on we shifted to the epigastrium and that's how the subcutaneous port was placed over the anterior rectus sheet. So this used to be an extremely simple procedure. Uh, most procedures were done as daycare. Patients were discharged either the same evening or the next morning of surgery with minimal morbidity. Then we had to adjust these bands. So the protocol that we followed was that the first fluid fill of the band was four weeks after the primary surgery. This was the time which was required to the band to get adjusted into its place. And then you started doing the adjustments. The second and subsequent fills is something which varied worldwide. There was no standard norm as to when to fill these bands. But what we followed was following the weight loss of the patient. Once the weight loss started to cease down, we adjusted the bands. If the hunger increased, we adjusted the band. And of course, the, there used to be a time when patients used to come and demand a fill to reduce their hunger, or they also used to come and demand removal of certain amount of fluid from the band in case they were traveling or going for a holiday. So there was various ways uh, uh, by which we used to fill these bands. Now, initially, if you see these bands, we used to fill under the fluoroscopic control. So all you wanted was a small streak or a very narrow streak of gastrographin going from the gastric pouch to the gastric remnant. And that was the fill that we used to place. It needed cost. It was x-ray exposure. So oh, later on, as we learned, as we matured in the procedure, we started doing these fillings subjectively in our clinics. So coming to the results, now this is extremely, extremely small because the number of cases, the duration of uh, the period in which we did these surgeries was very limited. So if you look at the duration, we did bands between 2004 and 2007. The total number of cases that we did was 84. We had 48 women, 36 men. The mean age was 38 and a mean BMI was 48. So we did not do very big patients. So this was the mean BMI and the mean age of patients that we were looking at. Looking at the comorbidities, we had about 42% of our patients who were diabetics, very unlike as, we, as what we see today, 17 years, 18 years down the line. Almost 60% of the patients who come in for bariatric surgery today are diabetics. Hypertensives were about 63% of the patients. Sleep apnea, this is something we see very differently now. We see a very high incidence of sleep apnea in our practice now. But then 18 out of these uh, 84 patients, that is 21% had sleep apnea. And we had about 57% of patients who were dyslipidemics. So how did we progress? What is the kind of results that we saw? And the results that I'm going to show you is very different as compared to what we see in the world literature. For whatever reasons that we faced these kind of results in our country. And this is not only us. I think this is the kind of results which was seen countrywide and the reason the bands totally were discontinued from the bariatric practice today until unless we have a patient who comes and demands a band. Not that we've done a band in recent past, but there are a few bands which do get uh, used up in the country even today. 
So if you look at growth of our, our surgery, we did about 12 bands in 2004, 37 bands in 2005. And after the first two years of surgery, we started to see this decline. In the third year, we did about 22 bands. And 2007, we did 13 bands. After 2007, we did not do even a single band for various reasons, because it was the third year onwards that we had already started to remove few bands for various reasons. And of course, the results of surgery, because this was a new surgery in the country, the news of the surgery was in the media all the time. So the word does carry that the patients, as far as weight loss was concerned, were not as happy as they would have been had they had a good weight loss. So looking at mean percentage excess weight loss, this is all the data that I have today. At five years of surgery, I'm not presenting any one or two year data. This is the data. This is the longest data what we have. At five years, we had a follow-up of 36 patients out of 84. So you can see a follow-up rate of only 42.8% at five years. So most, almost 60% of our patients were not following up with us for various reasons. An excess weight loss of 37.4%, that extremely, it is extremely poor as compared to what we see today with other surgical procedures. By eight years, we were only left with 16 patients, that is 19% of a total number, and we had an excess weight loss of mean excess weight loss of 28%. And by 12 years, we had only seven patients who were coming back to us. That is the follow up rate of 8.3%, and with an excess weight loss of 24%. So, the best weight loss, what we would have seen in the first two years of surgery, by five years, it had dropped down significantly to 37%, and by 12 years, 24%. When we look at the comorbidities, the data what was available to us was only for the first five years because the follow-up rate after five years became very poor and very random. So we did not have a good data available after that. So if we look at diabetes mellitus remission, I think this is one thing we talk about in all other surgical procedures as number one endpoint after X is weight loss. And when we talk about metabolic procedures, this becomes number one. So out of 84, we had 36 diabetics to begin with. And by five years, out of 36 patients who were coming back to us, we had 13 patients who were diabetics with an incidence of 36%. And at five years, we did not have even a single patient who was in remission. So all these patients were still under treatment, though had improvement as far as the HPA1C levels were concerned, but none of these patients were under remission at five years. So to expect any of these patients to do well after five years is probably not true. So this is what we have as far as diabetes is concerned. There were 53 hypertensives to begin with. At five years, out of these 36 patients, 26 patients were hypertensives. And all we have that their hypertension levels did not become worse. It was either improvement or status quo. Now, very surprisingly, the data that we have about sleep apnea, 21% of the patients who were sleep apneics, at five years, out of these 36 patients who were following up, seven of them were sleep apneics, and all 100% of these patients were in remission at that point of time, means these were the patients who had severe sleep apnea, did undergo repeated sleep studies, and with significant reduction in their apneic spells, they were considered as patients in remission at five years after surgery with a night, with a uh, average or a mean weight loss that I had already talked about. That is about 36 or 37% of the excess weight loss. Dyslipidemia, of course, as we know, and this is how the results were at five years, we had 23 patients who were in our follow-up at five years, and all, uh, all of these patients had improvement in the dyslipidemia, but of course, uh, not to the level of what we see today. So this is all the data which is available to me as far as comorbidities are concerned. So this is what I was worried about, that I may not have a significant amount of robust data, but yes, it does tell us a lot as to how these patients 
over a period of time did after adjustable gastric banding. Now, coming to a little more important or probably to the last important issue of these patients who underwent these bands is band removal. We remove 33 bands in our practice. Out of these 33 patients, 23 patients were ours and 10 patients were done elsewhere who came to us for removal of bands. There are n number of our own bands, probably they would have been removed at other centers. Initially was not true because there were very handful of centers in the country. But by the time, over a period of decade, the number of centers increased. So some of our patients may have gone to those centers for band removals. So we removed 33 bands, 23 of ours, and 10 of done outside. The indications for removal of these bands was erosion in six patients, five of us, one from outside, prolapse for two patients, both for our patients, and the commonest reason for removal of these bands was inadequate results, inadequate weight loss, that was 25 bands, in which 16 were our patients and nine were from outside. So in our set of patients, we remove bands ourselves in 27.3% of the patients. And the last band that we removed from our set of patients was in 2015. In the last five years, we have not removed the band uh, from the patients that we did. What happened to these patients? Out of these 33 patients, 30 patients underwent a revisional surgery for weight loss. So we did a gastric bypass for 22 patients and we did a sleeve gastrectomy for eight patients for various reasons. I will not go into those details. It was done as a single stage procedure in three patients. And it was a two stage procedure in which we removed the band. We waited for a few weeks and then we did the definitive procedure and that was done in 27 patients. There were no mortalities in our set of patients. There was no 30-day mortality or to our knowledge to whatever uh, follow-up we have. We did not have a procedure-related mortality in adjustable gastric banding. So this is something which is very similar to most results which are present worldwide. But the kind of weight loss that we saw in our practice was very different as compared to what uh, the data which has been published by the Paul O'Brien group in Australia, by Anglisani group. So they have all seen a decent amount of weight loss at 10 years, but we did not see a good amount of weight loss in our set of patients. So what were the reasons? So if you look at the patient's perspective, so to conclude, a patient's perspective was that this is a procedure which is not working, it is a failure, it does not give you good amount of weight loss, number one. I think the most important reason for these patients in our country not to do so well was because this procedure needs a very, very close and repeated follow-up in our clinics. There were patients who visited clinics once, twice or thrice in the beginning and then they disappeared. They came from faraway places. Follow-up in our clinics was difficult. There were not very many centers doing it. So I think that was the important reason because these patients could not follow up. Number three, I think this is something we heard from a lot of patients. This is a procedure which patients found that they could insult it easily. Patients could eat huge volume of food by just eating for a longer time. They could eat, they could eat, drink fluids, put the food down and eat again. So this used to be another follow-up that we used to get with our patients that compulsive eaters could still insult the procedure. There is no dumping syndrome. There was no vomiting. All they knew was how to handle excessive eating. And of course, a poor quality of life following adjustments. So every time a patient underwent a little aggressive adjustment, kept regurgitating for a few days and did suffer. So a poor quality of life. So these were the patient's perspective why they did not want this procedure done on anyone else or they wanted to reverse this procedure. As far as surgeons are concerned, I think discontinuation of this procedure was part of the surgical evolution. Earlier, all we looked at was safety and probably sub-importance to the results. But as we evolved over a period of time, 
we started to understand the disease better. We started to handle these patients safely doing more elaborate procedures. We got introduced to better procedures. We got introduced to ruin by gastric bypass, which had proven durability over decades, a procedure which was a common procedure in the West. So I think getting away from the bands and getting towards other procedures was just part of the surgical evolution. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This was our experience of laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding, what we did in initial experience of bariatric surgery in India, in New Delhi. So thank you very much. And greetings from the center where I work, that is the Max Healthcare at New Delhi. And over to you, VBU. Thank you very much. Dr. Bajal, thanks a lot, Ray. That was a, a comprehensive uh, overview of uh, um, and vast experience in the gastric banding. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the boss and Dr. Bandari are checking for questions, but I'd like to ask you a couple of questions, if I may. Uh, Absolutely. One of them might be, it's actually rather than a perspective, but uh, that will come later. Uh, uh, you know, we all remove bands, a lot of bands, uh, and, and my only observation about the numbers that you gave is that you were mostly by far removing them in two stage. Well, I mean... Correct. I was, I mean, we were here removing them by far. Uh, I mean, of course, removing, I mean, I mean, conversion to sleeve or bypass. We Correct. were doing that by far in one stage. Of course, we did, we do, the, do it when the tissues were, you know, we need to do extensive dissections and you don't like the situation. But the way we found it was favorable, I would say in 96, 97% of cases to do it as one stage. Was it, is it related to, the type of the band or do is it related to the uh, technique you know the technique you've shown was the very initial technique for band where you put the balloon uh, at you know uh, 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 at, the, at the at the entrance to the stomach and then you suture gastro gastric by the time we it became popular a lot of people were doing only one gastrophrenic stitch rather than three gastro gastric uh, stitches that probably might help i don't know what's your perspective. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Taha, for your comments. I think the only reason is this was almost decade and a half back. So that was the time we were just getting introduced to procedures like ruin by gastric bypass. Sleeve was very new to the armamentarium, to the procedures that we do. So it was only purely out of safety because we were new to gastric bypass as well. So to be safer, to have better tissue available to us when we do our ruin by gastric bypass, that was the reason we did two stage. Of course, if a patient comes to us now, we will always do a single stage procedure until unless a patient is coming for an erosion. Thank you. Uh, my last, I mean, my other thing, amongst other, if I have time, I'll, I'll, let the, I'll leave the stage to us. I mean, I'm in the screen, not the stage anymore to, to, to <laughs> the colleagues, uh, uh, is that I think one of, I mean, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not a pro band. But I believe that it still have a certain place in the bariatric surgeon's armamentarium. I, I stopped doing bands just like you did mostly. But the question is, I think one of the reasons why bands were abandoned, you probably touched briefly on it twice when you were comparing results of the band with results of the bypass, which I think, if I may, is unfair. Because, I mean, if you put a band in a, a patient with 48 BMI, it will fail. Uh, and, and the bypass will work. So uh, it's bringing a, a knife into a gunfight. Uh, of course you lose. So, so, so the thing is, I think one of the reasons that when we started, when we had nothing other than the band, we were putting the band for everybody. Even for those who don't even qualify by far right now. Probably it will be, we'll be ridiculed if we said just a band for them now. But we were putting them then 15 years ago. And of course the, the outcome was disappointing probably had we had other options and we used the band for those 32 to 33, probably the, the outcome would have been different. Just a thought. So Dr. Tai, you are absolutely right. The time when we were doing bands, we did not have any other procedure in our hands. So we were doing only band for all kinds of patients. Yes, all of them. So this is the reason we say today when we teach all the youngsters who start to do bariatric surgery that you cannot be a one procedure bariatric surgeon. Absolutely. You should be able to offer all other procedures. 
but as part of the surgical evolution when we started to do other procedures we probably got away from bands and one of the main reasons for us to get away from bands is that the follow up a close follow up and a repeated follow up to the clinics is a little challenging here and that's one of the reasons we completely stopped but your point is well taken i think each and every procedure today has a place in bari- bariatric surgical practice of course ladies gentlemen of the faculty if you have questions boss everybody is muted no dr fobi is muted dr fobi no yeah all are, are muted we can't hear anything no dr right. fobi wanted to say yes. something yes uh, dr shivram please move on to the next and then we would have the panel discussion later right. okay thank you sir um dr silvia winner has been very well introduced by dr bhandari and uh, she is talking on a very very interesting topic that is approaches to reinterventions after a uh, laparoscopic gastric banding i think very relevant and uh, very important topic hello ladies over to silvia ladies and gentlemen i welcome you to this short talk in this very nice session of the virtual bariatric university hosted by professor malfobi and mohit bandari thank you so much for the invita- invitation to present today My topic will be the approaches to reintervention after laparoscopic gastric bypass. My name is Dr. Sylvia Weiner from Frankfurt, Germany, and uh, I'm hosting the Department of Bariatric Surgery. Um, this, regarding the disclosures, of course, I have to thank to my team. I have no disclosures regarding the industry. Thank you to my team and especially Dr. to Dr. Mustafa El Shafai, who's um, my partner in this clinic. We have a big team, as you can see, a lot of nutritionists, bariatric nurses, psychologists, and of course, surgeons. According to IFSA recommendations, I want to show you our case mix disclosure. We do about 400 to 500 uh, procedures per year in our hospital. This is the case mix. We do uh, mainly wound-wide gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomies in our clinic. As you all might know, we have a big discussion going on about the long-term results of gastric banding. We have a lot of publications indicating that we have a, a conversion rate in between 50 to 70% percent, uh, after uh, seven up to 15 years. And we predict a little bit that uh, the laparoscopic gastric banding will not stand the test of the time so that we need to talk about the way of re-intervention. We all know that Australia might be different. You all know the good results of the, the working group of Paul O'Brien and John Dixon, which leads us a little bit to the conclusion that uh, continuous patient uh, surveillance and care might change also the long-term results um, of the surgery itself. The question is, and we will discuss later on probably, if there are still indications for gastric bending, um, because we know that we are treating a complex metabolic syndrome and uh, we have to ask ourselves if we really alter that, uh, if we put a pure restriction on the stomach of a patient. The most common indications for a revision or inter- re-intervention after gastric bending are Uh, weight regain, as we know from the Swedish obese subject study, um, that we have a weight regain with the gastric bending patients over time. And of course, slippage and migration might be an issue. Regarding the weight regain, we of course have first of all to check if there's a proper positioning of the band. And if it's there, then we might be have options regarding um, a lifestyle intervention, but also a medical uh, intervention. You all know the GLP-1 analoga a little bit on the way of success in the treatment of obesity and diabetes itself. So this can be used as well as an addiction to the band uh, to extra modulate the metabolic effects Uh, before we talk to the conversion to another procedure. As you can see, the proper uh, band positioning must be checked in before to exclude slippage or migration uh, before we start conservative treatment. If there is a slippage of the band, of course, we can talk about repositioning of the band, but once again, we have to ask ourselves if we want to replace a restrictive procedure again with another restrictive procedure which has been proven of being not efficient in the long-term uh, results. 
Um, before we talk about the converse, uh, conversion to another procedure, of course, we have a lot of literature indicating uh, that there are good results, but also are indicating that we might be talking about a two-step uh, approach, which means removal of the band and then later on re-evaluation with the patient and discussing the second procedure if still necessary. If there is a weight regain and the patient is reporting about dysphagia, which is mostly associated with slippage, we have to assume that there might be even a body set point change with the patient, that they have been a uh, lifestyle change as well. And we see in the most cases the slippage as the cause. But of course, we have to exclude that there's any kind of ulceration, any other condition causing dysphagia, uh, maybe H. pylori infections or maybe even um, malignancies going on. So we need an other endoscopy uh, and before we can talk about uh, any kind of further procedure. So we need a complete checkup with a nutritionist, psychologist, radiologist, and also with our endoscopy. If there is a slippage, of course, we can uh, talk about anterior and posterior slippage. The question is, does it matter? I say no, uh, slippage is a slippage and we need to remove the band. Um, we have to be aware that if we see emergency conditions, like I show you here in the CT scan, um, with a severe slippage um, affecting the blood supply of the stomach already, we have to remove the band ASAP. And uh, of course, we are not talking about uh, a same stage uh, reoperation or revision in that case. The same about migration. Um, as you know, the patients might be reporting a weight regain after a phase of vomiting, a dysphagia, a sudden loss of restriction. Sometimes we see port infection as an indirect sign. So of course we have to explant the band and we talked about conversion to another procedure, but it's clearly recommended in the literature that we should have a time interval in between um, in order to um, have a better safe procedure and better results afterwards. The big question is the type of the revision. Of course, we have some good literature results about rebanding, a uh, wide gastric by bypass, one anastomosis gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, BPD, scopinaro, and malabsorptive procedures. And as I could see in the last year's discussion going on, always which is the best procedure for a patient. I think that's the same like uh, we do a primary indication to discuss with the patient and to adapt due to his uh, comorbidities, uh, psychological status and compliance as well. And of course, we have to a little bit respect also the other comorbidities going on and the wish of the patient. We have to consider aspects of safety, not only about the results, but of safety. And uh, as we have uh, a nice publication going from last um, two years ago from uh, Thomas Rogula and colleagues, um, they have been showing of the analysis of the American registry that the safety um, might be uh, good after either with the sleeve and with the gastric bypass. Um, but also this study is recommending a two-step uh, approach because a single stage conversion uh, led to a greater morbidity and higher complication rate. There are similar reports on the one anastomosis or mini gastric bypass as a revisional bariatric surgery. It seems to be safe and uh, seems to have good results as well. As we must be aware from different studies, we can see that the revisional bariatric surgery or the conversion surgery might not exceed the weight loss achieved after the first bariatric surgery. And we have to talk with that with the patients. So uh, conversion to another procedure might even also just maintain uh, the weight loss achieved or just not induce um, such a big effect like um, the first um, operation. And why is that? Because we have to remember the pathophysiology of the obesity. Um, we have a complex system um, regarding biological factors, lifestyle, and uh, of course, chronic inflammation, increased fat storage, uh, adipose tissue redistribution, and of course, um, incretins. 
And if we're talking about incretins and a chronic adaption after the gastric bypass already to the restricted food supply of the patient, we must keep in mind that if we change the uh, procedure uh, that we might First of all, alter, of course, these mechanisms, but we do not alter them as good as we do it when we do a primary malabsorptive or um, metabolic procedure. So we have to keep that in mind. And this is also the reason why um, the most studies cannot report a very good effect after just simple band replacement or repositioning. So in conclusion, what we can see from the literature, and I could spend hours uh, in presenting studies, but, um, the discussion is still going on. Uh, in conclusion, any, any kind of procedure is possible, but we should respect the metabolic status of the patient. We should respect if there's diabetes, uh, hypertension, if there's coagulopathies, um, and we should have a clear workup previously. We should consider medical treatment in before revising the gastric band. And uh, what is very clear from the literature that we have a two-step approach, which is to be recommended. Metabolic changes should be respected in the decision. But there's still some open question, and I would open that for the discussion as well. Um, what do we do about patients who had had a sufficient weight loss, but they face a complication like a slippage or a migration? What do we do with these kind of patients? And we see some patients who had a very good result with the gastric banding, but of course, uh, they face a complication like a slippage, for example, and they present in our clinics with a BMI of 28 or something. Do we really need to wait for a rate again, a regain before we convert it to another procedure or do we go straight forward? And we are always discussing back and forth because we know we have a metabolic disease, a chronic metabolic disease. So normally we should clearly change uh, the therapy. But if we see a low BMI patient and we change the therapy and we, we adapt another procedure to the patient with a risk of complications, we are a little bit in the discussion if we do the right thing. So maybe we should need uh, to wait for weight regain after band removal. And maybe there are also some patients who might maintain their weight loss, but there aren't really no big studies reporting or reporting on this on like really maintained weight uh, after band removal. Therefore, I would like to invite you to continue with the discussion for the 12th Frankfurt uh, meeting, um, which we a little bit put on the issue of metabolic attack. I think we should stop the discussion about restriction and um, malabsorption. We have a metabolic disease, which we approach on a metabolic way, and therefore uh, the banding um, might not be the future for the treatment. And therefore, also the revision of the banding might be not the rebanding. That would be my conclusion. And I'm really open for the discussion right now. Thank you, Dr. Silvia. That was an excellent talk on the approaches to re-interventions. Um, very nicely, you have talked about the obesity as a complex disease and the pathophysiology is very complex. And uh, what is your take that uh, if they, a procedure which is restrictive fails, we should go for a metabolic or the ball absorptive procedure than dealing with another uh, purely restrictive procedure? What's your take on that, Sylvia? Um, thank you. As I already have said, I mean, the, the the theory of restriction and malabsorption, I think it does not work. We have to stop the discussion. So we have to see if a, a, a surgery has some metabolic effects. The sleeve does have metabolic effects. We are working on the choline. We are reducing, for example, the um, amount of acid. So we have a different or a change of, of uh, adaption to the food and we, we change the addiction of uh, to food. Uh, we don't do that with gastric bandings or balloons. So um, in the end, we, we need, I think restriction is, is not the way anyway. I mean, we can put some uh, 
some stuff to the to the teeth and to to to, to, to suture the mouth of people, and they will still not lose weight. We all know that. And um, maybe I think it's a good option to to work a little bit more with the GLP-1 analogs. Uh, they are much more right now on the market, and might be a good effect with patients. So really, some patients with the bending um, weight regain, we treat with GLP-1, and they have very good result. We leave the band in, so they have like a little bit restriction, of course, but we add a malabsorptive or no, not a malabsorptive, a metabolic issue without doing a surgery. So um, we have to be in between the lines, but rebanding only is, I think, no, no option. Right, right. Thank you. See, the only place where bands are still uh, maybe some popular and working is in Australia. You think there is anything different they are doing or is it just because of the good follow-up? What yes. is your take on that? I, I had the opportunity working together with Paul O'Brien and John Dixon a couple of years ago. I'm, oh my God, it's 20 years already ago when I was working with them. I'm getting yeah. old. Um, but what they have, they have a very strict system of uh, follow-up with bariatric nurses. So they come and see the patients every half a year. They come to their home and they're going to visit the patient. They, they have a nutritional support. So it's a very close follow-up because the, the system is different in Australia about um, you know, post-operative care. So they have a very very, very good follow up and not just the patient has not to come to the clinic they were actively followed up and they have to by by bariatric nurses and nutritionists and i think that makes the difference as well and we know it from conservative studies as well as soon as we follow up our patients and as we force them to like report all the time of course we'll even have an effect with with, with no surgery just in by looking at the patients um, so they have some different uh, structures in the system, but no, I, I don't know the healthcare system in the world who can really provide it regarding the, the high amount of obese patients worldwide. Um, so mainly, I guess it's due to the system and we cannot Hello. provide it in Europe. Thank you. See, there is um, a thought that if we have to adopt one step procedure, it is one anastomotic gastric bypass, which has a edge over other procedures because you are doing an anastomosis at the distal end where there is no adhesions or any disturbance from the previous uh, band. You agree with that or you have any experience on that? Yes, I agree on that. Just it's technically a little bit safer because we are far away from the scar tissue. So that's my preferred recommended procedure actually after gastric bending. Um, the risk of um, a leakage with the sleeve, especially in that scar tissue is a little bit higher. And of course it depends on the patient itself. I mean, sometimes we explant bands after 15 years and the stomach looks like completely new. Then we are open to any kind of procedure, but uh, doing the high, um, high pressure sleeve after a gastric bending might a little bit increase the risk of, of uh, um, insufficiency or leakage. Um, therefore, I'm a little bit yeah, conservative and I prefer the OAGB as a second step procedure. And as I was talking about in the, in the, in the talk, uh, we have an adaption of the body. So the body set point, as we know, is wrong already with an obese patient at any time. And as soon as we did one procedure, the body has once again adapted. So we have to expect a, or to, to do a stronger change to the patient and uh, right. to, in order to correct that situation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sylvia. Over to Dr. Phobi. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Dr. Professor Taha, you still do laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding, don't you? Quite infrequently, yes. Yes, because I know I, you're one of the few people that still does it. When do you decide to do it? Is it when the patient requests it, or do you have that as part of your algorithm? Yeah, I think, I think yeah, it is, it is a very, uh, what do you call it? a set aside, but always available part of my algorithm. Uh, I think my own impression with all, respect, with all respect to the experience of everybody is the patient selection. Well, it's, it's, I, I agree that there's no data so far about using it below, below, below 30 BMI, but definitely I go up to 31, 32 probably, but 31 definitely in a patient who has been steadily increasing weight over the past year, year and a half, like from 26, uh, from 29 to 31 in, in a year. And they really are genuinely interested in losing weight. Uh, and they are willing to do those two things. You know, I insist on that the patient should understand that they have to chew. Gulping food is, is never 
working with the band and they should abandon all the binge food and the sweet food. So if they are willing, of course, they will go for a psychiatric assessment, a psychological assessment, sorry. And if they are fitting those criteria, then, then yes, I would go for it. The thing with it is that it is definitely the safest procedure we have. I mean, just like uh, Dr. Mani showed, no mortality at all. And uh, it is a, a, you know, data shows that 80% of patients who have a band still have the same band 10 years down the road. Uh, and, and it's adjustable. It's very important for us here in this part of the world for pregnant women, they definitely, they, I don't know, they love to eat differently. You can just deflate it and then you can inflate it. So there is no need for a new procedure. But having said that, I'm, you know, I'm not doing more than like six bands a year, five bands a year. That's what I'm doing. And I'm doing uh, like 350 to 400 annually, uh, bariatric surgery. So it constitutes a very low percentage of, 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 of my cases, but, but there are really people who I believe they, uh, they need it. Because you know, what's the other option? A, a balloon, it will go out in five months, six months, and patients will go back to gaining weight. Tablets, drugs, so many uh, contraindications, so many uh, restrictions, and again, six months, and then they'll go back to it. So this is for those very minor percent, this not minor percentage of patients, this is a, a long uh, 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 lasting procedure that can help. Patient selection, I think, is the key. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to Dr. Wong, please, for the next speaker. Yeah, hello, everyone. So uh, thank you for bringing up this uh, symposium. And I, I think we have heard about the past that uh, doesn't manage to uh, discuss on the band, and then the current situation and the vision by Sylvia. And now we should move to the future. And maybe uh, Natal, uh, Professor Sudong, from US can bring us some idea on the future on the new uh, gastro trips and updates. So uh, Natal, can you show us what is going on? Thank you very much, uh, Simon, for the presentation. Uh, I'm going to share the screen now. I want to thank uh, Mohit, Mal, and congratulate also the FBU for, for the, the job they're doing online. Uh, so I'm going to make you an update on the very clip, but I'm not sure everybody knows it. So I will do a basic stuff also. So when you see the current procedures, you see something like the bypass that the patient look at this like this. One of the reasons we did so many bands is because people didn't want the bypass then. So until the sleep didn't came, people rather not do it or do the band. They didn't like the bypass and we all know the consequences of having a bypass in your lifetime. Second, when you talk about the sleep, the sleep set is a procedure that people do more in the world, but still they have complications, say 2% of leaks with patients staying with chronic leaks up to 24 months, 18 months, and reflux is becoming the other issue from the sleep, even that for me, it's a very good procedure if you don't have a leak and you don't have reflux and you don't have a metabolic problem. So, so this is the two procedures. And also the band that uh, my own experience, I did close to 3,900 bands. And as it was mentioned before, I, patient selection is very difficult for me. So I don't do that anymore because I don't know whom to do this one. And probably we're gonna discuss that. So the Barry clip we started long time ago, I would say like eight years ago with animals and then we moved to a patient. So this is basically the barrier clip is titanium border reinforced by a silicone. And the measurement now is 14.5. When we did it smaller, we have a problem with some of slippage and erosions when we find the perfect size and the perfect position. I'm going to show you how this improved very much. This is when you have it lateral, as you can see, this is already covered and what is inside the clip. And also when you see it position, you look there are some black spots. That's where we're gonna place this future lateral or a medial, posterior or anterior. And the sutures now go in between those whole titanium, a whole titanium, because when we didn't have this titanium on the side, 
we got slippages from ripping the uh, silicone. So now we have that reinforcement. So that's how you're gonna see it lateral. This is one that we have transparent. So you understand very well how it looks. And the big opening we have down there is, so the remnant who stayed there can clear all the fluid from the stomach, but also you can scope a retro from that hole to the rest of the stomach. So you will be able to examine the whole stomach all the time. So as you can see here, this is how it looks. Uh, there is a bougie here. We always place a bougie to make sure it looks good. We do biopsies of liver in some cases as a study, but we don't do it routinely now. We did it just as a study. And you can see here, you have the bougie here. It's a bougie 36. We don't do it to measure. We just do it to prevent the getting the, the lesser curvature. And that's how the, the clip looks. Uh, this is how the scope looks <clears throat> during surgery. So you do a, a scope. You can see it looks very similar to a sleeve. But then you can go back and take a look to the stomach that is abandoned. And that's what we like more about this one. You can still examine the whole stomach and you can check how it looks. And as you can see here, how it looks like a sleeve uh, when you do it there. Uh, and it looks pretty, pretty, pretty good to scope. For the clinical work after we did all these animals, <clears throat> we started, and this is published already, the first 149 patients. The European Union asked us to show reversibility. So we needed to remove the clip in 15 patients uh, that they didn't need removal. But we have then 10 patients with slippage that was 6.71%. And we have erosions in total of three patients for a 2%. We move now to 167 patients worldwide. Uh, the FDI study was gonna start last year from the pandemic, it's been postponed. So as soon as this finished, we're gonna start the FDA study here. Uh, but it's already approved by the European Union, the CE approval. It's already been placed in the Middle East. It's already placed in some Latin American countries, trials going on in Brazil. So hopefully we will be around the world very soon. Uh, this is the weight loss result that we have. As you can see here, in blue is three months, six months, 12 months. The number of patients we, we were able to follow up, up to 30 months. And the results that we have are, were pretty good, close to 63% of a, a excessive weight loss and with very good BMI changes. Also, when we compare results from many publications related to the band, to the sleeve, as you can see, the big lamp that is in the green, it has much better results than the band and very close similar to the sleeve with some advantages that I'm gonna mention soon. One is a uh, reflux. The big, the big lamp, we have 5% of reflux. No patient has reflux, <clears throat> sorry, after a month. No one single patient has reflux after a month. This is not a high pressure system. I, because of the orifice I showed you, you will be able to have no pressure at all. So the, the, the nausea and the reflux goes away after a month. That's one big difference with the band and with the sleeve. Also, if you take a look how a sleeve look in fluoroscopy, take a look, this is the clamp, of course. Look how it looks when you do an a, a upper GI study. It looks very, very similar to a sleeve. Yes, with time, some of the fluid is going to go to the other side, but just fluid. Food is not going to the other side. And as you can see low down here, there is the opening. There is no titanium here. It's only silicone. So the rest of the stomach that is here is going to evacuate very easy to the intestines without a problem. That's, you're not going to have pressure there. So... Comparing with the first one that remember we have to remove 15, when we take a look to the 267 patients, when we did that modification of adding that titanium on the side of the holes, the slippage went from 7% to 3% because now you cannot rip the silicone. So slippage is something that we don't see very often now. And erosion, we have the same patients, but now it's 1.2%. Why erosion changes? Because most of the erosion, we have them when we use the smaller length, 13 centimeters, we don't use that one anymore. As you can see here, this is a couple of the slippers we have at the beginning and the atom of this titanium opening 
that changes the slippage a lot. And then we have only one since then. Since we had that one, we have only one. We, we have three erosions. One, what, when we use the smaller clip, uh, then there was too much pressure for the patient, not presented as peritonitis, not presenting as an acute problem. We were doing x-rays to all our trial patients every six months and endoscopy every year. So we detected them and then we removed it laparoscopically without a problem. You cut the silicon down and then you take it with no problem. I don't think you can take this one by endoscopy like the band. I don't think. We haven't tried it though, but I don't think you can take them that way. We have no transfusion in any patient. We have no infections. We haven't converted one patient. Yes, we are the same group of surgeons doing all the time, but the results still pretty good. Uh, this is uh, still in process. Uh, this is an international registry that has been collected by Patrick Noel that is doing cases in France with another two groups. France just ordered another 100 clips. They're doing a study by themselves. Uh, Jordi Pujol has been doing it since, since 2027 when I did the first case there live. And this is the registry we have. And as you can see here, the changes on the weight loss, the BMA changes, and if you take a look to the patient that we follow already to 37 months, it's 62.5%. So it's very similar to the one we have in the first studies, but it's very consistent through the years. 62, 64, 62. Uh, so we are very happy with those one and that includes patients from Brazil, Chile, France, Panama, Spain, and the uh, Emirates. We published this also with uh, Nedelku, Patrick Noel, and myself, the quality of life. And for me, that's one of the biggest difference with the sleeve and any other procedure. The satisfaction of the patient with the clip is pretty good. They don't suffer reflux. They don't have any, any big complaints about almost anything. And they were very happy with the clip. So really the clip is not like a sleeve. The precursor of the clip is like Magenstrasse and Mill procedure with the difference because you don't staple and you don't cut, you're not gonna get reconnection of the stomach, et cetera. And the result of them were 60% at five years. And that's what we're getting, more or less than 60% of those patients. So in conclusion, to be on time, is much less invasive than the sleeve. It's an outpatient procedure, is reversible, totally reversible. You don't need maintenance. You don't need to adjust. You just need to follow these patients. We don't have no reflux. We are not doing organ amputation that is scary to some of our patients. Um, for the study that the Ethicon did a while ago, uh, is per se as less surgery than a sleeve at the bypass. So the patient acceptance has been pretty good. So we are now waiting to start the FDA trial, but in the meantime, we start to do cases again in other places where it's approved. Finally, I want to let you know that we expect everybody in Miami this is gonna have a presential part, if so, 2021. Even if we need to do some virtual, uh, they are already happening meetings in, in, in the US, especially in Florida. Uh, so the hotel and we are prepared to do this very safe. PCRs will be done before you enter to the hotel and to the rooms. And they're already, I mean, Coca-Cola did a 5,000 meeting already here in Florida. So we expect everybody to come. Whoever cannot come, we're gonna transmit. But we're planning to do it presential here because as everybody's expect to see each other and I hope you can make it here. We are already open for upsets. So thank you very much for the opportunity again for this marvelous job that you've been doing with this university. Thank you. Thank you, Natal. So uh, this is very fascinating uh, to see this new device. And uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, it looks like a VPG to me uh, without the band. So how, how do you have any um, study on the reflux or pH on this patient before and after the procedure? And my second question is, uh, do we me did you measure the uh, hormones like ghrelin uh, type of uh, uh, appetite hormone after the boost to see whether it changed? The one, the, when I go to the second one, that is the easiest one, Jordi Pujol in Barcelona is doing that study. So he's gonna publish it this year. So far, it seems have results similar to the sleeve. Not, not, again, it will be exactly like between the band of the sleeve. So it works like that. 
So he studied specifically ghrelin. So we're waiting for his results. Uh, but three years out, he's been very happy with this. And he, he presented in the uh, European Association, I think a couple of months ago last year. Regarding to the reflux, we never considered reflux a problem. So we didn't do the studies of pH, but the Brazilians are doing it. And they study, they start the study just before the pandemic. So they are doing 50 patients, five zero, and they study that. They are studying reflux before, reflux after, even that we don't put it as a contraindication here. Uh, I didn't mention that, but we have from the 267 patients, I would say 10%. They had hiatal hernias that we repaired during the procedure, but reflux is not a, is not a problem here, Simon. We, we, we haven't seen problem with the reflux, but and we understand why. The opening you have down there, there is no pressure. There is no pressure like you expect in the other one. But so we're happy so far. I will add something. In my concern, uh, having a foreign body for a long time will be my biggest concern. Uh, so some groups like the Brazilians are promoting this for a temporary device between five and 10 years. So after five years, they're asking the patient, they come back. So they review erosions to remove it. Uh, but for me, one of the biggest mistakes uh, and, and the people who put bands like me a lot, it's we expected this to be forever. And we, we, it was not forever. Was, even that I have patients 15 years out with very good results, the band in place, it's a foreign body. You change breast prosthesis after 10 years. You change every prosthesis, hips, you change it after 10 years. So this, this is no different. So I expect them to be changing. Thank you for the question, Simon. I think the concept is very nice then. Uh, so did you put it in the patient with high test hernia? Yes, I mean, I do the same that I do with the sleeve. Any patient that have a hiatal hernia more than four or five centimeters, I don't do sleeves and I don't do clips. Because I think that having that going back after recurrence close to 50%, if you don't use a mesh or something like that, I don't want my clip inside the chest. I don't want my sleeve leaking in the chest. For those big hiatal hernia, I either repair the hernia first and come back three or four months later, or I do bypasses that I, I don't see that much problem when they go to the chest. So, so I, I pay attention to the hiatal hernia, yes. Very nice, no doubt. Very good presentation, thank you. Well, Latan, you did a lot of teaching around the states and worldwide using the adjustable gastric band. Do you do any at all now? Zero, zero, but the reason is this one. As I mentioned before, I only, I brought to like 450 surgeons around the world for the band. I also placed myself like 3,900 bands. And when I take a look to my own numbers, we have 37% of success. 37, that is not bad. I mean, it's not good, but it's not that bad. My problem is we went back with the whole group, take a look what make one patient successful and the other ones didn't. And we couldn't find it. So we, I, I couldn't find that reason. I cannot have it in my algorithm now because I cannot find the patient selection and, and I, I don't want to fail. I have other options now. I have the sleeve, now we have the clip. You know, you can do some DSs, but in the past we have only bands or bypasses. So I don't do it anymore. The last patient convinced me to do a band when I was doing a sleeve in her mother. And she came back a year later to, to be revised to a sleeve. So, so I don't do that anymore, but that's the reason. That's, that's the reason. I have patients that they are very, very happy with the band, but they are, I mean, 60, 67% or 60 something percent of failure is a lot, so no. Does any of the other faculty members have questions of any of the speakers? So I have one question for Nathan. Can I ask, Dr. Phoebe? Manish? Go ahead. Yes, yeah. feel, feel free. So Nathan, uh, a significant difference in reflux as compared to sleeve. I did not get the point where you said uh, that the area down close to the pylorus is open. That's why it doesn't reflux. So can you just... Uh, if you could explain a little more on why the reflux is less, because the biggest worry today with sleeve is a reflux. Yeah, there are, there are very various reasons why you have reflux after the sleeve. One is a high pressure system. That's the number one. This is not a high pressure system. If you take a look to the clip, there is a big opening at the end that goes to the remnant who is there. 
So that removes the pressure from the stomach. So there's no, there's no pressure like you have in the other one. Second one, when you do a sleeve, sometimes you can do it very narrow. Here we put the, the bougie, not the boogie, sorry, or the bougie, whatever. You know, I don't speak English, but so when, when you put the bougie there, uh, we don't do it to calibrate. We use it just to make sure that we don't put the clip very close to the lesser curvature. So this is a little bit wider than the, than the, than the sleeve. So there's not really much pressure there. Uh, and, and third one, the clip itself doesn't close completely. It allows some fluid to go from one side to the other one. And there is no pressure for that one. The most important one, one of the reasons you have reflux is either bad angulation uh, strictures or kinking. We are not stapling or cutting. You cannot have bad angulation because we don't use the clip like this. You know, we don't use it like this. We use the clip straight. So there's no bad angulation, there is no kinking, and there is no strictures. So there are all the reasons you usually have reflux. So reflux, yes, you have it for a while because you have swallowing, ed edema, you know, but after that is gone, you don't see reflux anymore. I, I think that's the reason. Thank you. At this time, I invite the faculty to stand by. We would like your interaction as we go to the live surgery. Uh, the patient will be introduced. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we could not offer you a laparoscopic adjustable gastric binding case today. And so Dr. Bandari is going to do, I think, a, gast a banded gastric bypass. Uh, please please feel free to comment, ask questions, and uh, make any comments during the operation. At this time, the patient's profile will be introduced with my uh, program director, Dr. Winnie Mathieu. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Phoebe. I welcome you all for the VBU episode 19. And uh, today we have a 48 years old male patient who is weighing 120 kgs with a BMI of 40. He's a diabetic and a hypertensive oh, patient. Oh, okay. His diabetes is uh, HbA1c 7.34. Regularly, we get all the patients' uh, COVID tests done, so the COVID test is negative. And now I'm passing on to Dr. Bhandari, who will be doing an intraoperative endoscopy. Okay, so good evening, everybody. Uh, we always do an intraoperative endoscopy in most of our cases, uh, just to rule out uh, if there are lesions which preclude a particular procedure. Uh, this patient does not have any esophagitis. Mm. Also in this particular case, uh, we also rule out if there is any lesion in the duodenum because uh, as you know that we will be doing a gastric bypass, which makes uh, it a condition that in certain cases we won't have the access uh, to, to the duodenum so easily. So uh, as I see that the duodenum is pretty much okay. Uh, we don't see any issues here uh, with the first and the second part of the duodenum. Uh, also, uh, here we try and see if there is a hiatus. The hiatus looks fine. Uh, we don't have any such problems, although if there would have been a hiatus, we would have repaired it. And a gastric bypass is uh, a more suitable case for uh, such kind of uh, anatomical problems. Uh, at this stage, I would remove the scope uh, and uh, would explain you my port position. So uh, this is the port position which, on which we are working. We have a optical port, which is just above the umbilicus. We have two 12 mm ports on the side of the optical port uh, in line with the anterior axillary line. We have two 5 mm ports, both two finger below the subcoastal angles in the anterior axillary line. I've put an Athensons liver retractor. The first step, uh, so in total, we are working with five ports and one Athensons liver retractor. Uh, so this is a, the first part is to just check for the hiatus. We already did that uh, by an endoscopy, but we just try and make sure that we are able to see the hiatus. Uh, here we have the small bubble. So I will be doing the infracolic part of the gastric bypass first. So as you can see, we have a lot of thick omentum, which are already divided after putting the ports just to save some time. Uh, this area here is the ligament of trites. Uh, the landmark is an inferior mesenteric vein, as you can see, and the ligament. So I'm going to count from here. And I have markers, as you can see, 10 centimeter mark on both my graspers. So we sort of mark, uh, calculate this and uh, uh, mark these limbs in a way that our BP limb is around 
80 centimeters. So this is 80 centimeters. And as you can see that uh, uh, this limb is arranged in a C loop pattern. So uh, we see the mesentery in front of us. Now the advantage is that, for example, we have one of the sides of the mesentery more or less through the stapler, we can equally divide it like I did. Uh, so if the mesentery is nicely exposed like a flower, uh, that step is very easily done. Now I'm doing a little bit of scoring of this mesentery because uh, we are doing an anticolic, antigastric anastomosis. And this patient is a little tough one for the banded gastric bypass, a very bad visceral fat. And you can see that you know, patient on insulin plus a little bit of uh, metabolic component of metabolic syndrome can make things difficult for us in, in future. So I'm just sort of uh, being on the uh, cautious side, dividing or scoring this mesentery in a little, uh, uh, so once in such cases we reach the base of the mesentery, uh, it's more uh, comfortable for us to use the sealer here because uh, sometimes the harmonic might you know, cause more uh, uh, damage and we, we may not be able to take care of the bleeding. So this is gonna be my BP limb. I'm gonna mark it with a clip. Give me a clip. So that's the BP limb just for the sake of uh, teaching case. Usually we don't mark it, but uh, just for the sake of a teaching case, I'm marking it with a clip. Uh, I don't mark it because I always keep in the left subcostal area. So this is the location of my BP limb and that's the location of my elementary limb. Now 10, 20, 30, as you can see, I'm counting it with the graspers. Mark 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100. So usually my uh, limb lengths for uh, the elementary limb length for these kind of cases where you, know, you have a patient uh, around BMI 45 or something, uh, less than a BMI of 50, uh, we keep the same BP limbs. Uh, as I said, 80 centimeters and the elementary limb is always 100. Uh, or 110. Uh, this is mostly to prevent the bile reflux into the gastric pouch. Now about the question of uh, basically changing these limb lengths. So in very severely diabetic super obese patient, we do go above 150 centimeters uh, or close to 150 centimeters. But uh, as per our algorithm, most of those patients are actually suitable for a mini gastric bypass. Now, there are conditions where if we are not able to give them a mini gastric bypass and uh, still they are diabetic and gastric bypass becomes an essential thing. In such cases, we increase the limb lengths, as I mentioned, uh, to around 150 centimeters for severely diabetic super obese patients. And those are the conditions where we are not able to give a, a gastric bypass are those where, uh, a mini gastric bypass, pardon me, are those where either we have a large amount of uh, esophagitis or we have... Uh, you know, pre-existing pre history of a GERD, or sometimes the patient is from an area where we cannot do a lot of uh, follow-ups and then we need to do a more of a restrictive procedure. So those are the areas where I would increase a little bit of limb length to give more good resolution of diabetes. Now this defect which we created can be closed either by a staple. So here I'm trying to close it by a staple gun. We can also close it via a suture uh, so uh, the essential part is that while doing this, we make sure that the lumen is not compromised. So there are different techniques used by different surgeons to close it. I have standardized it to this and basically we make sure that the lumen is not compromised. You can see nice lumen on both the sides and that's what we want to see. So this is the elementary limb here and that's the common channel. So that's the common channel, that's the BP limb and this is the elementary limb going back up. Now I'm going to take a, a Brolin stitch here, which is an empty obstruction stitch. So we'll make sure by that particular stitch uh, that uh, the elementary limb remains straight in line with the common channel. So this is the elementary limb here and this is the common channel. So it remains straight in line with the common channel and uh, we sort of do not face uh, kinkings, obstruction at that level because a kinking or a obstruction at that level, which means that this loop is gonna go like that, something like that. So that can sometimes, uh, uh, you know, create a, a obstruction. So this is uh, one of the stitch which we take as an anti-obstruction stitch. And uh, it's, it's always nice to have 
this stage. The other advantage is that we can always use this as a retraction stage. So, uh, you know, we close all our internal hernia defects, whether it's uh, mesentric defect via uh, uh, mesentery like this. So you can see there's a large hernia already coming through this. And I use this as a retraction stage. So you can see that uh, we can use this particular area here to retract it through our left subcoastal port to expose the defect if sometimes it's not visualized. I'm not using it here too much because I have good assistance. But if I'm operating somewhere outside where I don't have, I can use that as a retraction stitch uh, to expose that specifically in robotics, we use that as a retraction stitch. Uh, or maybe if, if we are operating with not a regular team, we can use uh, them with fellows and all. It works as a good, very nice retraction stitch. Now what I'm doing here is trying to close these defect. So as you can see, I'm first uh, securing the base of these defect. And that's the area where most internal hernias might occur. So, uh, you know, we are taking sutures very close to each other so that we create some nice additions here. This mesentery is not one of the best, I would say, I would not like to handle mesentery like that. Uh, by the touch and the feel of this mesentery, I can say that it is, uh, you know, something where you have a very bad metabolic syndrome. So, which means that there are chances that the mesentery will get tear off, plus there will be more oozing and bleeding. And it's very heavy, very fat laden, uh, more uh, sort of rigid kind of mesentery, which usually we have in patients with severe metabolic syndrome. So you can see it's little rigid now, uh, which does not mean that uh, necessarily uh, the defect becomes very difficult to close, but just we have to be cautious because uh, to approximate it sometimes, you know, it's a little bit of a trouble. So that. This is the part where I just want that we take nice sutures uh, uh, close by uh, so that uh, the additions are formed here. And uh, uh, we always use, as you can see, we are using ethibond here. We can use a silk or a proline to close these defects. Uh, mostly a non-absorbable uh, suture, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, can give them a good closure for infinite period of time. Uh, most of these hernias occur at third to fourth year. Once a lot of this mesentric fat is gone, they can even occur despite this closure. Uh, but I have realized that uh, we need to do the best for our patients and uh, that's the way we minimize the chances uh, to the maximum. Uh, so that's what we try and do. Uh, that we minimize the chances of uh, these uh, uh, internal hernias to minimum. Uh, at most, what I have seen that despite closure, I had a Peterson's space hernia very recently, uh, uh, despite closure. But then they, this is, you know, we are talking about out of 5,000 gastric bypass, even the cases are less than 0.01%. Uh, I, I can tell you that if we are not closing these defects, uh, the percentage might increase uh, to even uh, more than 2%. I, ha I know that there are other centers who are not closing these defects and they have these problems uh, which come to them. And these are not coming to you in one year or two years or three years. They may even come later than uh, that period of time. So that's the uh, major issue with these uh, kind of... Uh, uh, so that's why I, I would advise... Uh, for the closure. I know that there are some centers who close this defect, but they then, then they don't close the Peterson space. And uh, then uh, also we have faced certain problems with the Peterson space. So uh, the advice is to close them absolutely. And that's what we are trying to do here. Uh, although this defect is the uh, mesentric defect, uh, but we will have a Peterson space, which will close a little later on. Uh, at the same time here, we always try and ensure the bowel continuity. Now you can see that there's a little bit of dip here. So I'm going to take the suture exactly from that place. And then I'm going to go on the opposite side. And this, now you can see that we have completely closed this defect. And uh, I can see the bowel continuity. So this is my elementary limb. And this is my common channel. So I can see continuity anteriorly in front of me. And that's the end of my uh, closure of the uh, internal hernia defect. So uh, this is the first defect in a gastric bypass, which we closed. And as you can see, this, this defect is uh, completely closed. Uh, 
And does any of the faculty members have any comments so far? Questions? Okay, now, Mohit, go on. Yeah, now I can go ahead and uh, as you can see, this is my elementary limb here. I can go ahead, create a pouch, put in a band and do the gastrojejunostomy. So at this stage, we will just change the position of the patient. So the trick here is that uh, uh, just uh, put the patient on a little bit head up position. Uh, so that gives us a better view of uh, this area at the G junction. Uh, now uh, we do a pars flexida. We have been doing that. Uh, and we, uh, uh, Dr. Phoebe usually do a perigastric at our center. We do a pars flexida. So we could compare our results and there's no difference in terms of weight loss or more or less marginal ulcers or more or less uh, diabetes resolution. They're all the same. So we chose to do this pars flexida, which looks to be a little technically simpler than uh, the other uh, methods uh, which are used. Uh, and we have been doing this now. So we are pretty confident that it does not cause more damage than the other methods. There are small vessels here, which needs to be taken care of like I'm doing. And once we reach this area, we can actually go ahead and fire a stapler. Uh, I use a blue reload to basically make this pouch here. So this load is a six centimeters load, but we don't fire it completely. Um, the pouch I'm trying to make would be of a length of around uh, eight centimeters because we're gonna put a band. This is a little longer than what we would have done usually uh, because we are putting a band and the band has to be two to three centimeters above the anastomosis. I'll use a little bit of harmonic here to dissect. So the first the point is that we need to go posteriorly and check if there are additions between the posterior wall of the uh, stomach here and the pancreas. If there are no additions, just a little bit of dissection using a blunt grasper here. Uh, not, not too much of a dissection so that I can bring in my uh, uh, stapler and enter into that space. Uh, so as you can see, I'm not, I've not used too much of energy source close to the G junction. If need be required, I'll come back again. Now, once we locked our stapler in place, we would ask our anesthetist to bring in the bougie. You can see if he's able to push it along. And if he has a problem, he's not able to push it. We just gonna relax and then ask him to come back again. So you can see that this, this process might take a little bit of time because most of the times now the bougie is there. So why this happens is because we have a lot of dependency here close to the area of the fundus. Now, once the bougie is there, we always make sure that we appreciate the tip of the bougie. Can you show me the tip of the bougie? Okay, so that's that's the area where we need to see. Give me a push, push the bougie, please. Okay, so now what we can do is uh, once we have the bougie in place, let me fire this. Once we have the bougie in place, we can actually do the firing of the stapler. And then uh, we know that the bougie is in place, only then the stapler be fired. Because at most times what happens is that if we fire the stapler without the bougie in place, I have had an occasion where I thought the bougie is in place, but then I fired and the bougie was not. You can even make pouch, which is, you know, pretty narrow. And later on, you can face the difficulty in passing the bougie. So I always make sure that I see the tip. Uh, in such patients, what are the challenges? Sometimes because of a lot of fat here in this area, you cannot see this tip. Like I'm able to see this tip here very nicely, but sometimes because of a lot of fat in that area, you are not able to see the tip. And that's the reason where that's the point where you need to dissect this fat, even if it bleeds a little. And if we can dissect this, this amount of fat, we will be able to see the bougie more clearly. So that's the point I'm trying to make. One more cartridge, please. Push the bougie. So also, uh, one has to remember that while you are making this gastric pouch, the bougie can recoil back. And so you need to ask the anesthetist to keep pushing on the bougie so that we don't have problems in making this pouch. Now, the trick is that I rotate all this momentum towards the infracolic compartment. Now, the point I was trying to make, this is the trick I do. I do a little bit, very little dissection close to the G junction. I've seen surgeons continuously using uh, harmonic shears here, or they may be using, uh, you know, uh, other devices like a gold finger. But what we do is little bit of dissection posteriorly. And then, you know, what we find is a pouch where we don't need to go close to the G junction. Now we have this band here. So we'll put in a band. I'll create a perigastric space. Uh, 
So this space will be created around two to three centimeters below the G junction, as you can see here. This is a small perigastric space. And then, you know, with the bougie in, I can easily enter. So you can see that I have easily entered inside with the bougie in. Uh, and then uh, I can, you know, put this band in place and lock it before I start to perform my gastrojejunostomy. So that's the band. Uh, it's a silicon ring, which we made uh, by the all silicon material. We can, you know, we can have bands which are company made, but if, if the patient cannot afford it, we can make these bands which are even safer, uh, equally safe, you can say, uh, as compared to the company made bands. Uh, although uh, our rate of erosion is a little bit higher with these bands, which are uh, non-company made, but still uh, it's not as high to stop us from using them uh, permanently. It's almost a negligible difference. Uh, also, these bands which we put are easy to remove by endoscopy because you have this proline thread. If you cut this thread, the band opens and can be easily removed uh, by endoscopy. So there are certain advantages to putting these bands and they work equally effective. We have no difference in terms of weight loss, or weight loss maintenance when you compare them with uh, bands made by companies. So uh, this, uh, this is something which is even used in US uh, because in US the bands are not approved. So surgeons can make their own bands uh, uh, and uh, they can use these bands on their patients if they want to. Uh, so this is uh, where I can have a ruler scale please so I can measure the pouch length and I, can you push the bougie, please? Push, keep pushing. Okay, so now this is the ruler. So I can actually demonstrate where my ring is placed and what's the length of my pouch. So that's the G junction. Let me measure the length of the pouch first. So the length of my pouch is around 7.5 centimeters, as I said, and the ring is around 3.5 centimeters below the G junction. So that's, uh, that's the kind of, uh, uh, measurements with which we are working. I'm going to create a gastrotomy here. I make sure to create a very small gastrotomy around 0.5 to 1 centimeters. And now we have uh, this limb, which is our elementary limb. I'm going to make an anastomosis here. So uh, usually, can I uh, just, usually this anastomosis will be made of around 2.5 centimeters. And uh, this uh, anastomosis, the, the internal diameter will be around 2.5 centimeters. Uh, so, okay. so now we can just take this and that was the reason why we scored the mesentery a little bit because we realized that in patients with such bad kind of fat in the metabolic syndrome, we just need to be a little more, you know, you can say a more uh, cautious approach towards mobilization of that mesentery. Okay, great, thank you. So once we are there, uh, the bougie can also serve, as you can see, you have seen here, bougie can serve as assistance to, so here, once we do the anastomosis, it is around three centimeters by the cartridge, but with the kind of suturing technique I use, uh, you would agree that the internal diameter is around two to 2.5 centimeters. So I do a lot of this uh, burying of the mucosa inside. Uh, that's the technique we have been using. So now we are able to see this and this is how I secure the caudal end of my anastomosis. So what we principally do is uh, we basically rotate this bowel up uh, on that side so that we are able to see the posterior part here. And I take a conal suture. So the first suture which I take is usually from inside the anastomosis. So this is my first suture. And uh, uh, so we are securing sort of the caudal end of the anastomosis. And once we are done with this, uh, we can come out through the same uh, pattern after taking this bite. So you can see that this is the area I'm working with. Uh, I can rotate this bowel piece here, uh, the loop like that, so that I'm able to see more clearly. So now I can go there and I can basically take one more suture inside. And then I can, just because I know that I have both the corners in front of me, I can come out and do a, a layer of conal. So this is uh, the bubble side of my anastomosis and that's the uh, gastric part, which I'm trying to tackle. So I'll come inside through the gastric part 
and now you can clearly see how I'm securing it. Then I again come out through the gastric part. So this is sort of a Kunels. Um, what it basically does is that if I have an area which I want to secure clearly, I, I have a good control of that area. So you can see that this area I have a good control of and now I have secured this caudal end. I would take just one more, uh, you can say, uh, bite here, one towards the bowel side and the other towards the stomach side and this caudal end is completely secured. So I can cut this end now here. So this is, and you can see it's not under any sort of tension. I can cut this end here. And I can, I can use this also as my retraction stitch. So this end here is cut and that's proper typical Connell's. And then I can go towards the Kifilad end and start to suture from area beyond my uh, enterotomy, gastrotomy complex. So that's around two centimeters beyond uh, the area where I made a gastrotomy and enterotomy. And uh, so you can see that this area is here and I've gone a good distance away from that. Uh, the other way to do it would be to come through the anastomosis uh, like I did previously. So uh, we can also come from inside the anastomosis out. So that's that's the other technique. Uh, I use that also sometimes when I am not pretty sure or the vision is not good. But this here I can see that I'm exactly away from the area of gastrotomy and enterotomy. So I'm using this here. And now you can use this as a retraction. You can triangulate if you want to. And then, you know, I, I keep on this is a single layer anastomosis. So I just um, try to come towards the area of my stay uh, in the caudal end. So just simple two or three uh, shots at it and you know, we would be done. So this is very simple. We, we never changed this technique uh, since last 10 years now and um, more than 5,000 gastric bypass being done here with the same technique. So we, you know, sort of develop more confidence in when you keep on doing a single layer and uh, uh, you know, almost uh, negligible leak rates. Uh, uh, I could count them on fingers. So that's why we use this uh, same technique and the same thing is being done by our fellows and other consultants in the department. So uh, this is something which we are more confident about. Single layer, first securing the caudal end and then securing the kefilad end. Uh, now I can rotate this. So I see that I have uh, nicely uh, secured. I would just take another bite here uh, very close just to, uh, you know, completely cover off this area. So now I crossed uh, my previous stay stitch. So I crossed this stitch, the one at the caudal end, uh, coming from the kifilad, and now I can take two or three rows of knots. So now again here, when we use an endo stitch, we try to take a surgical knot. So I took three rows this way, and then I can go back here, cross this, and make like a proper surgical knot. So that brings to the end of the anastomosis. Uh, I'll do an endoscopy post-op, but let me first demonstrate how I close. There's no need to bring in the bougie. I'm gonna come in with a scope to demonstrate uh, all those who are watching it. But first let me demonstrate how we close the Peterson space. So I know that most surgeons uh, do not close it. Even still the gastric bypass surgeons, I, I know some of the centers did not close it. The reason why surgeons shy away from closing it is because they cannot expose it. So we have to expose these defects. So now you can see that there is a big, a big amount of momentum here uh, and that, that's the area of the Peterson space. So my trick is make the patient a little bit head down and then all this, uh, all this particular momentum can go back uh, there just like we are rotating it. So you know I have a very nice vision now. So now you can see that my defect is nicely visualized. Everything is in front of me. Uh, I usually use my assistant to make a knot here. As you can see, I have a knot with the endo stitch. Um, this is our technique. And when we demonstrated it, most surgeons felt it's easier than what others were doing. And it's more simpler. It, at least the aesthetic part of it or look wise, it looks more comfortable. Uh, so now you see, because of that knot, my, one of my hands is retracting this. And the other hand uh, is using the endo stitch while my assistant is following my suture thread. So that's the beauty here. What we are doing principally is we are trying to use uh, our setup to the best of our advantage. So I already make a pre-knot, so I don't waste time in making that knot because if I have to knot it again, one of my hand would be occupied. So I just made the knot pre-hand. You can use it by a simple uh, 
maybe a VLOX suture. You can put a knot. I think VLOX have knot uh, in them beforehand only. And then uh, it becomes simple. One of your hands get free and then you can, you know, go on taking sutures and closing it. Uh, our convention is to use endostitch because, you know, we do uh, at least 10 to 12 surgeries daily out of them. There are five to six gastric bypasses. So it makes our job a little faster uh, every day. Um, I was doing a lot of uh, conventional suturing in my initial practice days, but then once our volume increased, we thought maybe we standardized the endostitch device because that made us at least a 20 times, a 20% faster, pardon me, uh, in most of our surgical cases. So that's the closure of the Peterson space, as you can see. Now there is no defect here. I completely close that space. And I'll use the same suture. I'm not going to waste my suture. We have to save resources. So I'm going to use the same suture here to uh, sort of fix my ring. Can we give a head up? So I'll use the same suture to fix my ring. Uh, so that's the ring. We already demonstrated the position of that particular ring, which is around 3.5 centimeters below the uh, G junction. Uh, here and the ring is of size 7.5 circumference diameter and you can see it lies pretty loose over the pouch. Even with the bougie in place, it will be loose over the pouch. So that's not obstructing the pouch in any way or uh, sort of creating an effect which can give patient problem. But what we find after some days is that a small capsule is formed around this ring, just like we see in adjustable gastric band and that capsule prevents the reservoir capacity of the pouch. So that's, that's the complete gastric bypass. Uh, let me come in with an endoscope and demonstrate you uh, the internal anatomy. Uh, the pouch is of a length 6 to 8 centimeters. Uh, the anastomosis 2.5. I'll further, uh, you know, would ask you to collaborate the length of, uh, sorry, pardon me, this, the width of my anastomosis. I go inside with a, a small scope, 1.5 centimeters. So the scope I'm using, the endoscope is 1.5 centimeters. And you can see how much space apart from that remains inside. So this is here. We are into the esophagus. My assistant has blocked the elementary limb. This is the esophagus. We'll find a little bit of blood because there's some oozing while we make the anastomosis. That's the Z line, the Z line here. Uh, that's my pouch. You can see the staple line in my pouch. And that's my anastomosis. So I'm going to go here. Okay, so that's the small bowel. That's my anastomosis here. And this is the uh, size of the anastomosis. So as you can see that a scope 1.5 centimeters is here. And the anastomosis looks nice. We have a little bit of ooze from this area, but it stops eventually. And this is a, this is a nice looking anastomosis, good patency. Uh, this is our staple line of the pouch. I can also measure the pouch length here. It's exactly six centimeters. That's the ring indentation. This is the ring indentation and that's the Z line. So thank you very much. If there are any questions, I would be more than happy to answer. Okay, we'll open it to the panel. Uh, Dr. Wong, you do quite a few gastric bypass. Do you do anything different? Uh, I think everybody did uh, the gastric bypass uh, on their own way. So looking at this way, this is quite uh, a special type of anastomosis technique of the single layer. But it seems working well. I think you have worked for thousands of cases. I, I think this uh, something that worked for you. My question is, uh, when you're sizing the pouch, what's the size of bougie that you use? Uh, to, to, it looks quite, quite small at, uh, from my size, and uh, especially the ring is so big. So what size of a bougie when you uh, sizing the pouch? So that's a 38 French bougie. 38. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Natan, any comments? You do anything Ma different? Ma yeah, Mohit, Mohit yeah. first congratulations. Very nice case. So I have a couple of questions. For me, I, I try not to say in open anymore, but I don't close any defects. Uh, we had our experience at the time I was at the Cleveland Clinic and we get the same numbers of people coming back, even more. We have more patients coming back after the closure of our, uh, but I will say that it's a standard of care to close at least the Peterson space. So uh, that's what I, we teach our fellows now. So we don't close it anymore. Second, uh, 
I use from time to time this band in the past, uh, not specifically a male's band, but somewhat that we did with the venoclysis tubing in, in, in Colombia, and we use it at the same thing. The experience was not bad. Uh, erosions were like 2%. What is your number of erosions? Uh, you remove it endoscopically. And when you use it to revise a previous bypass, how good it works, how much that helps adding just the band to the procedure. So we have around one to 2% erosion. I would say 2% in gastric bypasses we have, I'm talking about banded sleeves. In gastric bypasses our erosion rate is almost nominal. I would say 0.01%. I have don't, I've not seen gastric bypass bands eroding too much. Uh, if you ask about the weight loss different, now we have a uh, seven years data. I think it's around 20 to 25% difference between the weight loss, between the banded and the non-banded uh, counterparts. But as the primaries, but when you use it as a revision now. Yes, as a revision, we have, as a revision, when we revise our sleeves, we convert them into a banded gastric bypass and results are very good. We, we, good, good. We are regularly doing, I mean, that's the procedure of choice for revising our sleeves. We convert them into a banded gastric bypass. Thank you, Mohit. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, Dr. Warren, you guys do quite a few revisions in Frankfurt. What's your experience? For the revisions? <laughs> um, actually, actually, in my, my personal cli clientele, I don't see too many revisions in the last five years, luckily. Um, sorry. Yeah. And um, but for the revisions, especially sometimes even if we see dumpings, we, we like to place a, a ring. We at the moment we use the, the ring from the company, but I really love that uh, you do it the same way. Like my father always is doing to to construct your own ring in the end. It, I think it works quite well, um, but we, we don't see too, too many where we put uh, the ring. We do a lot of overstitch um, in the last couple of two years, but I have a question as well. Um, <laughs> two questions. First of all, I mean, congratulations. That was really, really great. Uh, good to see. Um, one short question. When you do the up endoscopy at the very beginning, does your assistant close the bowel at some stage? Because I was astonished to see no infraluminal uh, um, uh, gas uh, once you do the laparoscopy. You know what I mean? Because sometimes yeah, our uh, bowel, bowel is always, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> Dr. Phoebe always wants me to express that point and I somehow forget that. <laughs> He, uh, no, we don't close, we don't block anything. In fact, the trick here is that that's what we wanted to demonstrate it to the world and good Sylvia that you asked this question. We have been, you know, forcefully putting it to the world, but they don't understand it. But now you, since you asked this, we don't block anything, absolutely nothing. We use carbon dioxide to do these endoscopies. And as you saw my trick, I went into the duodenum till the fourth part, but I did not put in a lot of air. Uh, minimal air, use of carbon dioxide and fast, I would not use the worst word fast, I would say swift endoscopy in around 45 seconds and you won't find even minutest amount of air inside the small bubble. The problems will start to happen when you sort of keep on, you know, wasting time there, keep on um, putting a lot of air into the duodenum and just without any use you keep on loitering there in that part of the small bubble. And then you end up having a lot of air inside the small bubble. You create uh, bubble entrotomies, which are inadvertent. Uh, you create uh, problems for your own self. So my trick here is first, first trick, use carbon dioxide mm -hmm. and it, it gets absorbed pretty fast. Uh, second is that uh, Try and do an endoscopy in a way that when you enter the first part or the second part of the duodenum across the pylorus, put very minimal air. Do not keep your hands on the air continuously to bubble it inside. You can work with minimal air. I can work with as minimal air as required. So uh, that's what Manuel taught me. I mean, we are not here to just dilate about bubbles, putting in a lot of endoscopy. These are not the etiquettes of endoscopy. And, and then you try to visualize the duodenum while you are coming out. Not try to visualize it, visualize it when you're entering inside the duodenum. So most people do the mistake is that they keep on pushing their inside and try to visualize the duodenum while they are trying to make an entry inside through the pylorus. Whereas what we should do is try and put a minimal air. Once you see the duodenum, push your scope and then slightly pull it back. The vision is much more better with minimal air. 
So these are some tricks which we use. Uh, plus you can obviously do the gastric pouch first if there is a little bit of air uh, or the carbon dioxide, but it gets absorbed very rapidly. Dr. Taha, does this answer your question from the last webinar about the cost of preoperative endoscopy? Uh, as a matter of fact, I, you know, you do, but the thing, the thing is, how can you solve it? I mean, we have all the facilities, but it's not covered. I'm now fighting with the insurance to even to cover the patients for revision who have reflux symptoms to know whether I'm going to do OIGB or ruin Y, and I'm having a big fight. So yes, I'd love to do that routinely, definitely, but it depends on, on the means. Well, do you, I mean, now that we can do it intraoperatively, do you need yes. to get insurance permission? That's part of the surgical procedure. No, that's, I don't. But then that the thing is, uh, I, I don't want to be uh, uh, looked at from a different point of view, but if you do it intraoperatively, routinely, that will add a lot to the cost of the procedure. And the reimbursement of the, for the procedure, might, you might end up, end up breaking even. It's very meager here, the reimbursement for a procedure is like, I mean, um, uh, it's, it's not bad, but it's not great. So we're doing it. We do have uh, the facilities to do intraoperative uh, endoscopy. Actually, we have a dedicated gastroenterologist to do that for us intraoperatively when we are doing it on selective basis, not routinely. But, but I see uh, the point. My, my question to you, Dr. Daha, is how does it increase the cost? I don't understand. It's a 45-second procedure. How does it increase the cost? If you are doing it, if you call a gastroenterologist to do it, it might increase the cost because then you need to pay him. Maybe if you do it yourself. So you're getting the scope for free, the tower? I mean, the scope is being used for uh, a routine uh, endoscopic surveillance for bariatric endoscopy, which is a part of the post-op care. But what additional cost does it put? I mean, scope is never for free, but that in any case you need to buy for a bariatric program. And we are buying it. I mean, we're not for, not for the bariatric program. We have a dedicated gastroenterology unit. Yeah, so, so already you have it there right in place inside your yes. operating room, as but, you said. But what additional cost does it add? I, I mean, I'm just, just trying I'm to you, understand. You, the, thing, the, thing is, the, the, the thing is, we don't we are not being paid for the preoperative routine surveillance. Okay, so, okay. I mean, yeah, I got it. I got it. Now. Uh, yeah. Dr. Taha, the point we're trying to make and teach here is, if surgeons learn how to do endoscopy, and quite a few of them know how to do it, and if surgeons do post bariatric endoscopy intraoperatively to check the pouch, then they can easily do intraoperative endoscopy before the bariatric procedure routinely. And that would not increase the cost. You don't well, seem to agree with that. I totally agree. Uh, I mean, I do, I do my own endoscopies. Uh, I do even my own stents. Uh, most most of the time, but I don't agree with you. And um, I don't know. I mean, I think we we'll probably discuss it when we meet about how how does the implication of cost in our setting here. I'm not talking about internationally. Our setting here. How does uh, the the routine intraoperative will be uh, reflect on the cost? But I agree that is a good a good way of compromising the situation. Definitely. Uh, so, uh, you a bit of endoscopy at your center in Frankfurt. I know that you and Dr. Steer. Yes, I mean, uh, we, we, the, uh, I have the chance that I can do it one day pre-operative right now, but we will change it in August. So in August, we will do the same way like Moet is doing it. So just like an intraoperative gastroscopy because we bought our own uh, gastroscope and everything. So I really like the idea. And we have been always discussing what if you find a pathological finding. So I know, or I, I, I try, uh, I remember that you explain all kind of surgery, uh, surgical procedures to the patients because we do it, we explain uh, sleep gastrectomy bypass and so on, just to be able to react just in case we have any kind of pathological findings like, like a gist or extopic pancreatic tissue or something like that, so that you can during the surgery switch to another procedure. How do you handle this issue? Yeah, yeah so, we, so what I did now is that we have a very, uh, very exhaustive algorithm, Sylvia, prepared by Professor Phoebe. And that algorithm now we converted it into different languages. And most of our patients are being educated about that algorithm that we're going to do an intraoperative endoscopy. And the choice of the procedure would be dependent on uh, Dr. Bhandari or Dr. Phoebe when they are intraoperatively or one of our consultants. And the patient will have to agree with it that uh, with the informed consent, and now we are taking video consents, that they have to agree uh, so for an instance, if we go inside with the preparation of a sleeve, 
uh, and we know that there is, we are given to inform that there is no hiatus or any history, but we find a large hiatus inside. We're not going to go and do a sleeve there. We would convert that into a robot gastric bypass. Uh, similarly, if we go inside with a complete plan to do a mini gastric bypass or a one anastomosis, and we go inside and we find the liver cirrhotic, we're not going to do a one anastomosis there. We do it do a sleeve. So we have that algorithm which patient will have to sign to. And now that algorithm is made a part of our consent. Uh, the consent form has that algorithm and the patient can read it. And it's a very logical algorithm which we have prepared. Uh, many centers have taken it as it is what we did. Uh, those who are doing all these three kind of procedures, most centers in India have taken that algorithm now. Uh, and they are very, so that's the way. And the patient also understands that, you know, uh, whatever would be done inside the operating room would be done to the best of my uh, intentions to help the patient. Uh, and we don't have different charges for different surgeries at our center. It's the same for any surgery. So, uh, you know, we are ethically that way is very correct. We don't charge more for a gastric bypass than a sleeve. Uh, we are very different in that way. So they know that when Dr. Bhandari or Dr. Phobi charges the same, what they do is the best for their patient and they've already informed us. That's commendable. So, Ram, you do quite a few the video, the, the video, uh, the video constant, that's really, really will make it a solid, a solid evidence, really. That's great, really. And charging the same for... Yeah, so, so, that, so that, that we did, that we did in 2000, that we did in 2019. And, you know, I, I was, I would be honest with you here on, on this platform that I was not very happy with Dr. Phobi's decision initially in 2019 that uh, we would choose the procedure. The patient would not choose the procedure. But then he convinced me and he said that, uh, Mohit, I can tell you, you won't have a patient going against your advice or would refuse for a surgery. Uh, I was very skeptical in 2019. But when I started to do it, uh, it increased my recognition and my credibility as a surgeon. Only that I can tell you. And we do not charge differently for different procedures. Yeah, that's a great scheme. Really a commendable scheme. Really. Dr. Okay. Weiner? I have a question yeah. because I really did like your demonstration, first of all, of the anti-kinking stitch, we do it as well, and also about the proper closure of the internal hernia. And my question is, I mean, just generally, if we do the um, OEG beam, we are not closing any kind of Peterson space, even so we are creating some kind of Peterson space in between the meso of the colon and the, the, the elementary or yeah, limp. Do, do you close it or do you have any experience? Uh, yeah, it? so, so you know, it does, you're very correct. There, there is no logic as to why we should not close it. But no, I don't close it. Uh, the reason which I tried to find out that why we don't have internal hernias in our center because I feel an MGB patient loses a lot of that mesenteric fat, so that defect is very, very large. And plus that anatomy is a little different than the gastric bypass anatomy with the end uh, rue to a loop anastomosis. So these are the reasons, but uh, I agree with you that if we close it here, why, why we do not close it there? That, that's something which uh, Dr. Phobi wanted me to do, but our data suggests 0% internal hernia through mini bypass in 10 years. But if you if you if you convert an OGB to an Ron Y, then you oh, close of, it. Of course we'll close it. Of course we'll close it. <laughs> no science to it, but something we do, Dr. Bijal, Manish, what do you want to say? Go ahead. So uh, continuing the same discussion, uh, we burnt our fingers by not closing the defects initially. So we in fact, uh, when we were not closing the defects, we saw an incidence of almost three percent uh, internal hernias. And ever since we've started to close it, now it's less than 1%. So we strongly, strongly recommend everyone to close both the defects. And that's what we in our experience, because we don't do one anastomosis gastric bypass, we don't have any experience on Peterson's hernia there. But uh, I believe there are few reports of Peterson's hernia, even after a one anastomosis gastric bypass. Okay, Professor Taha, go ahead. Yeah, actually, I mean, just responding to Sylvia and commenting on uh, uh, Dr. Bandari's. I, I mean, I didn't do a study, but I went intentionally comparing visibly between the defect, the Peterson defect in OEGB and Ruin Y. And you can easily find that it's way, way even before they lose fat, it's way much bigger. Absolutely. Longer. Absolutely. That's, they, uh, uh, that's, that's my only logic to it. It's, it's way bigger. And I can tell you something. I have done that. I have not done a study because... 
uh, it doesn't make sense. But I can tell you what visually I see. The defect is way bigger. Number one, number two, when you go inside to revise an MGB, that defect is further larger yeah. because of a loss of fat. So that's the reason why we have very mm -hmm. less incidence of Peterson space through mini bypasses. You're muted, boss. You're muted, Prof. Fobi. Sorry, Dr. Mm -hmm. Shivram. What is your Thank experience? You, you meet a lot of fellows and people at your institution. Tell Rebel now. Oh, I was so wondering. You have MGB and you have the banded bypass. How do you choose which patient in these situations? Yeah. So, very nice question. So now, uh, all our bypasses would be banded. We don't do a non-banded gastric bypass. So. Your question is primarily, how do you decide between a gastric MGB. bypass versus an MGB? Yeah. So uh, I can tell you, it's very simple. Again, the algorithm, I think we should have one presentation in every webinar and it's very interesting, very nice question. So if we have a patient who has GERD, history of GERD or a, or a hiatus hernia or somebody who has esophagitis, we don't offer them uh, mini gastric bypass. That's the first contraindication. The second is patients who cannot turn us up for a follow-up who live a lot of distance away from us and we know that they're not going to come up for a follow-up. We do not give them a mini gastric bypass. Number three, for patients who we know that cannot afford the cost of supplements or have a bad liver, will not get a mini gastric bypass. So these are the cases where we would offer a gastric bypass, which is always banded at our center. Now, where a mini gastric bypass would be preferred, so super, super obese patients with good liver, who can afford the cost of the supplements, very severe diabetes, a lot of insulin, no GERD, no hiatus hernia, very uh, enthusiastic about follow-ups, get some mini gastric bypass. Excellent, excellent. And you also do the long pouch uh, gastric bypass? When no, I, we have not done many. Of... We occasionally, but no, no experience, not a lot of experience to uh, be authoritative on that particular surgery. We that, just did a couple that, of those. That is only done for patients with uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass who present with reflux. Yeah, bile reflux. So we just divert the bile. That's just, uh, diverting. Bile. Yeah. Thank Dr. you. Yeah. Okay. We have exceeded our time. I want to thank all the faculty members. It's been an interesting session. This has been recorded. It will be on the VBU website, which you can access. And at this time, I would... Uh, have the promo for the next VBU, which is next week on the 1st of March, same place, same time. Thank you all for giving me your time, and I hope you found this very interesting. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you everybody. Go ahead. Yeah.